Good morning and welcome to this service of worship. We are so happy that you could join us today. Um, those here in our sanctuary and those watching from home, we just hope that you'll join in and be a part of our worship today. And we would ask that you would start by joining us and saying our affirmation of faith together this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning and, and welcome. So happy to see so many here. So happy to know so many are joining us online as we as we come into this next week. And this is a big week, uh, I realize, especially for our community as we're going back to school. Uh, thank you for all that were able to come to the, the prayer service. We had a, a pretty big turnout, and uh, uh, we just really got to come closer as a community through that. So I thank you for that. I do have just a couple of announcements uh, real quick this morning. First off, uh, many of y'all already know that through our preparations and, and through our cleaning efforts with the church, we have purchased a disinfecting machine. Now, this machine allows us pretty much to go from room to room, and it fogs the entire room with disinfectant. It puts it on all the surfaces. It's really neat, and it's really actually kind of fun to use. You just kind of walk around and, and, and blow it around. Now, the announcement I have and what I want to ask is we need people to help us to do that. Um, right now, it's only me and one other person that's doing it. And uh, so we need some people to come and help us out with that. If we have just at least five people come and, and volunteer to help us with this, and, and don't worry, we're going to train you on how to do it. It's a single man operation. It's easy to do. We generally do it either late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. Uh, if we just have five people, that means everybody could really only do it once every month and a half. So if anybody is interested in helping us out, this, this cleaning team, as we're going to call it, disinfecting team, please get with me, uh, call Christy, uh, just let somebody know so that we can start kind of getting a calendar together. Also, my next announcement is one that we've already spoken about. This week is a big week with, uh, with school starting, and, and the main thing that we talked about in the prayer service that we had this past week is not only are we praying right now, we're going to continue to pray throughout the school year for our educators, for our, our staffs, administration, teachers, and especially for our students as well. So let's make sure that during this week, uh, in your morning prayer time, lift up a little prayer for our schools, for all those that are involved with it. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, Lord, we just thank you so much that we're able to come together on this beautiful day and join and worship together here in your holy house. Father, we know that we receive many, many blessings from you. Too much to even begin to name off. But even in the midst of these blessings, Father, we realize that we live in a fallen and a broken world. To which, Father, we lift up many to you this morning. We pray, Father, that you be with all those who are sick and infirmed. We pray that you be with their caregivers, that you be with our doctors. We pray that you be with our students and the educators. Father, we pray you be with our country. Father, we continue to ask that you speak to our nation's leaders and that they receive your word with open hearts to bring us united under your name, Father, because we know that's the way it's supposed to be. Father, thank you once again for this time we have today. Open our hearts and our minds to the message that you have for us. As we say unto you, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, <coughs> thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, good morning again, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is actually an exciting Sunday. Uh, always Sundays when we start new sermon series are exciting for me, and I'm really excited about this next series that we're in. Uh, it's a series that's been titled, Catch Your Breath. The times where we feel that we're just so overwhelmed with one thing or another that we just need to stop and take a moment. Now this morning we're going to be talking about times of exhaustion. Catch your breath in times of exhaustion. How many of us have ever felt exhausted? How many of us feel exhausted right now? There's not many too, too many hands that went down. I think a lot of us at different times have felt exhausted and might even feel exhausted with our normal day-to-day lives. I'm talking about the things that not necessarily we're doing extra, but we're doing because we feel that we need to. The commitments that we have in our lives. Think of it like this, and I know you see all these chairs stacked up here, so you're wondering when this group of people are coming up. Well, they're not. Think of it like this. Think of these chairs as our commitments. And then think of the piano as God's true purpose for us. God's mission for us. So we have all these commitments, and right now they're in a a nice line, aren't they? I can move from one commitment to the next. But all too often... Our commitments are not lined up like that, are they? So let's take this one right here, and then let's say this is the commitment I have to my family. Actually, I should individualize this because Sarah Beth should get about three of these chairs. Now this right here, this is, this is a big one. This maybe should be two or three chairs too. This is the commitment I have to my church. Now that's pretty important, isn't it? And then we have another commitment right here. This is our, our finances the different finances we have. Uh Uh-oh, I'm starting to get crowded in here. But what about the commitment we have to our friends, to our extended family? So we add a little bit more. What about our commitments to our church? How many volunteer things do we do? You realize how quickly, and this is just a few, and I could probably name many, many more in, in my life, as well as your lives, that him us in. You see, all these commitments right now have become so crowded, I better back it up so I don't trip and fall up here. All these commitments crowd us so, so close in that we're unable to actually get to what we're meant to do. Those are the times we become exhausted. Because I don't know about you, but half the time, like I said, if I'm trying to get there, I can't get there. I can either go around this Or generally what I have to do is go from this to this to this to this and slowly start to move everything away. So you can see how our commitments, our normal everyday lives, keep us hemmed up. But do you see how these commitments can also block our access to God's mission? At one time or another in our lives, we have all looked, our lives have all looked like a chaotic mess. Even if things we are doing is important, even if these commitments are necessary, we have to find a healthy balance of doing and being in order for God to truly use us for His purpose. Now our scripture today is John 21, 1-19. And I understand this is kind of a, a long bit of scripture, but it, it's really informative. We'll go through it. John 21, 1 through 19. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon, Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. 
At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who He was. He called out, Fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then He said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 150 large, 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and eat, have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. And after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The third time he asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Now, in this account right here, and I know it was rather long, from, from John, we see that this is one of the ten appearances of Christ after his resurrection, but before his ascension. Now, this particular account happens after Jesus had appeared to the, the disciples behind closed doors, and it was actually directly before Jesus would appear to 500 brethren, as the Scripture says, and to his brother James. So at this point, the disciples, they had already experienced the resurrected Christ. They had already seen the resurrected Christ. And right now, they're kind of in sort of a, a holding pattern. You see, although they might not be totally sure on what to do, they still know, knew where to go. You see, after partaking in his last Passover, Jesus told his disciples as they walked toward that Garden of Gethsemane, but after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. So the disciples knew where to go. They went to Galilee where they decided to do some fishing. Now, I know a lot of people question the disciples' decision to go fishing at such a time. They had already experienced the risen Christ, and they knew that something big was about to happen. But like I said earlier, they had no idea what was about to happen. So I think the decision to go fishing was both wise and practical. The disciples still had to eat. They still needed to make a living. So what did they do? They went to work. They went back to what they knew. They went back to fishing. By the way, it's never a bad time to go fishing. But there is an important lesson here. You see, sometimes in the midst of our confusion, in the midst of our indecision, the best thing that we can do is go back to work. To go to what we know. Now the disciples, they they fish through the night and they have no success. So they begin to make their way now back to shore. And I've often wondered how the disciples felt at at that moment, after that night of fishing, possibly disappointed. You can think of all that they had been through, the excitement 
the anticipation to now be coming back from this, this fishing trip with the big fat zero. Or maybe it didn't bother them at all. Now there's been a few times, more than a few times, that I've been fishing and haven't caught a single fish. And it didn't bother me one bit. Because catching fish wasn't my main priority. Being out in God's creation was. Losing myself in doing what I know was. And I have to think there's a possibility that the disciples felt the same way. Just kind of wanting to get, get away, but at the same time not wanting to be idle. Maybe just for a minute to lose themselves in their work. Regardless of what they were thinking, though, the one thing I know the disciples were was tired. Both mentally and physically. Possibly even exhausted. You see, fishing back then was nothing like fishing now where we have power motor boats, ultralight rods, monofilament lines, and fish finders. Fishing in today's time is relaxing. Fishing in the disciples' time would have been tiring. The rowboats, the heavy nets, etc. So they're making their way back to shore tired and possibly even dejected when someone then, a stranger from the shoreline, calls out to them, did you catch anything? I guess it would really depend on their mood how they, they felt about that question. Well, no, we didn't, we didn't catch anything. Throw your net on the right side and you will. Now, I think it's just wonderful to think that Jesus showed up right there at their work. You see, He was interested in all their life, not just when they attended religious service. The risen Savior was showing men His interest in the common parts of their lives. So then Jesus makes this strange suggestion to His disciples. There was no real logical reason why fishing in the morning light might be better than fishing at night. There's no reason why fishing on one side of the boat would be better than the other side of the boat. It wasn't even directly a test of trust in Jesus because they didn't even know it was Jesus that was calling to them. You see, this was a test of their ability to find guidance from God in the small and unsuspecting ways, like a stranger calling out to them from the shore. You see, this illustrates the principle that we should never be afraid to change our method as long as it's at the direction of Jesus. So as the disciples are now bringing in this massive haul of fish, it finally uh, sparks a, a light bulb in one of them. Things aren't quite adding up. This isn't normal. And who was it that figured it out? John. John figures it out. It's Jesus. Now it's really fitting that John would be first. Think about it. John reached the tomb before Peter and the other disciples. He recognized the fact of Jesus' resurrection before Peter and the other disciples. And here, John also recognized the identity of the stranger on the shore before Peter and the other disciples did. You see, John knew that anything that wonderful had to come from Jesus. Now, John was the first in recognition, but Peter would be the first in devotion. Peter threw on his shirt as fast as possible, and he lobbed himself out in the water just to reach Jesus as fast as he could. The boat would not move quick enough for him. Perhaps Peter thought that he was going to try walking on water again. So, so Peter's out there swimming as fast as he can, just trying to get closer to Jesus. And the disciples are closely next to him as they come to shore. They all come to shore together, probably even more worn out than they were, were before, including now a, a wet Peter. And what did they see before him? Jesus. But not as they had expected. Not Jesus as some risen king on top of a, a, a mighty steed, but Jesus as a humble servant. You see, He had taken the trouble to prepare a fire and to cook food for His disciples. 
The order of the events here shows us that Jesus had food before them before this great catch of fish. What they caught added to the menu. It didn't make it. Jesus had prepared a meal for His worn out, exhausted both physically and mentally disciples. And He invites them to join Him. Have you ever noticed how many times Jesus just simply invites us to Him? Come and see in John. Come and learn in Matthew 11. Come and rest. Come and dine. Come and inherit. You see, Jesus knew the toll that had been taken on His disciples. He knew the exhaustion that they felt. He knew the physical and the mental strain that they were under. He knew the big things that they still had before them. So what does Jesus do? He feeds them. He nourishes them. He gifts them with a moment to just be. To rest. To catch their breath. To commune with Him and with one another. You see, as much as the disciples needed to work for Jesus, Jesus also provided that space. Jesus loves His disciples and us enough to feed us physically and spiritually. After this much-needed rest, we then see Jesus begins to prepare His disciples for the mission at hand, especially Peter. Peter actually gets called out. He asked Peter three times, Do you love me? Now Peter had denied his Lord three times and now Christ gives him an opportunity in some measure to repair his fault by this triple confession. And each time Peter responds with yes and each time Jesus tells him then, take care of my people. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. The passage then ends with Jesus telling Peter something that he has said multiple times and still tells us today. Follow me. You see, in this story of this disciples' fishing trip, we see a pattern that is still very applicable to our own lives. In our own exhaustion, in our own tiredness, Jesus still comes to us. He nourishes us. He rejuvenates us. And He also sends us back to work. You see, as much as we sometimes think the work is not necessarily the problem, the work is not the source of our exhaustion. It's the route. Finding the balance between being fed and feeding is what exhausts us. Christ is telling us that we have to find balance. He's waiting with open arms to give us that much needed break, that much needed nourishment, that much needed refilling that we need. The time to just be, the time to recharge us and then send us back to work. Because honestly, there's no doubt, especially in this world, that Christ has work for us to do. We are sent back out to feed others as a sign of our love for our Savior. We, the church, are called to roll up our sleeves and do that work. But at the same time, we're called to work in balance with still being fed. So are you a a doer or are you a beer? How is Christ calling you to find that balance between the two? How do we navigate through all the chairs that we have in our lives? By following Christ. Jesus knows the route. Jesus knows the easiest way through it. Jesus knows exactly when we need rest. He knows when we need to be fed. And He knows the mission that we have laid out before us. And He calls to us the exact same way that He called to the disciples so many years ago. Follow Me. I know where we are going. 
Set aside time for Christ. How many times in our daily lives, in our, our daily commitments, do we set aside just that, that 15 minutes even apart from church to truly commune with our Lord? To truly find that rest that He is reaching out and offering us. To truly take that, those burdens off of us. To truly rejuvenate us in a time where we feel low. You see, God invites us to clear out the chairs of our chaotic and messy lives. To truly catch our breath. Follow me, He says. Catch your breath. Because we're going to do this together. Let us pray. Father, Lord, some of, some of us have been going and going and going and are here now exhausted, worn out, depleted. So we give you thanks for this time to be with you. It's a large responsibility to be your workers in the world. Remind us daily of the times that we need to be fed. Remind us daily of the feeding you have asked us to do. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you all once again for joining us this morning. Next week, we're going to be doing part two of the, the Catch Your Breath series. And this one's entitled In Times of Doubt. I believe at all times we have times uh, of doubt. Uh, so uh, as we join together this morning, let's all stand up, open our arms to prepare to receive our blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 God bless. Love y'all.